Hello everybody, thank you for joining us today for our Succeed with Dyslexia webinar. The presentation that you are going to be watching is with Kim Brown from British Dyslexia Association and me, Julia, and I am representing uh, Succeed with Dyslexia in this conversation and I also work with scanning pens. So what we're going to be talking about today is uh, hopefully something that's going to be super relevant, not just for uh, learners who are in higher and further education, um, but actually in our whole learning online world, which we now seem to be all immersed in. So I think that what we're going to be talking about today is going to be really helpful for lots of people who will be at home and engage with learning and if you have dyslexia or weak reading skills or some specific learning difficulties I think you're going to find this a very very helpful presentation today. This is number three, can't believe we've done three now Kim, in, <laughs> our, <laughs> in our series of webinars uh, which is about the support that the dyslexia helpline can offer it's the frequently asked questions that come through to Kim and Kim uh, we're so lucky to have you helping us uh, with these questions Kim is hugely experienced uh, in the field of dyslexia assessment so she's somebody with AMDA status so she understands the teaching and learning she understands the diagnostics behind dyslexia uh, she's been a uh, member or so she is a professional member of the British Dyslexia Association and the Association of Teachers and Students with specific uh, specific learning difficulties. Shall I put my teeth in and try that again? Um, and she's got more than 20 years of diagnosing and teaching and supporting adults with dyslexia in a variety of settings. She is hugely knowledgeable and she's lovely. So welcome along again, Kim. It's great to have you. Thank you. Nice to see you again. That's grand. So let's let's think about our um, the people who we want to help today. I imagine you do get lots of call, calls on the helpline from adults learners, uh, people in the workplace perhaps taking qualifications for the first time who might not ever have taken qualifications before because at this point someone has said you're you're amazing go forward get you know you need promotion but you need to do this bit of training to do it which I know is a huge hurdle for a, a lot of folk with dyslexia but then we've got younger younger people as well who are perhaps going into university or colleges or moving on from a fairly uh, secure educational basis maybe where people understand and know about their dyslexia and maybe they've already had some support mm -hmm. and they're moving on and they're worried about where that support is going to go or who will um, who will take them on that journey of support mm -hmm. or it might be someone who's uh, struggled with dyslexia and done that amazing thing that we do which is obfuscate our learning difficulties and very cleverly hide behind strategies um, and then realize that actually this is a, more than you can hide from anymore and you need some support so this webinar is is for you and we're going to come across I think we've got four really good pertinent questions that uh, very frequent ones to the helpline and we're going to start yeah. to pick them with Kim today mm -hmm. oh lose my head there we go that's better <laughs> all in order all in order so shall we just have a quick mm -hmm. look I can see we've got lots of people here on the webinar today thank you very much for attending that's cool um if you have questions and thoughts as you go along and you want to put them into the chat box and we'll do our very best to make sure we answer your questions at the end of the session OK. Um, also, if you hear something, you want it to be clarified, we can do that, too. Mm -hmm. That's good. So let's go. Question number one. Um, I'm dyslexic and I'm unsure of how to get support at university. So this is a frequent question that, that comes into Helpline. Um, and it could be someone asking about getting support at uni or college or sixth form. Um, and people often find that they've applied for a course and then they've suddenly thought, oh, where's the, where's the support in this establishment? It's a bit different from a school. Um, 
So it might be good to separate this question. First of all, to look at university students, because what happens at university level now is university students have to apply for a separate pot of funding, which is called the Disabled Students Allowances. People shorthand that to the DSAs. And you apply for that through Student Finance England. And it's quite a straightforward process. It's um, a portal, that the Student Finance England portal that you log into. And it's a form there. And you fill this form in. And it, the first thing it requests is it wants evidence of your difficulties. So if those are not health-related difficulties, which would require different types of evidence, if it's dyslexia, dyspraxia, then you would have to upload your diagnostic report so they've got evidence and they won't process your claim without that. And in addition, your evidence must be by a specialist teacher who's got what's called an APC, which is an add-on um, qualification, or if it's from an educational psychologist, they have to be registered with their organisation, which is called HPPC. And then that um, evidence is required. And if you haven't got that, unfortunately, you have to get another assessment done. Mm, that's so that's crucial, that. isn't it? That piece of information. Yeah. It's the essential bit. If, if the person who does the assessment for you, I used to say you need to have an AMDA recognised professional yeah. to complete this piece of work for you. And you need to ask for that qualification from um, whoever it is. So I think what we need to do is make sure that we um, perhaps put in some information uh, when we put this up on YouTube and really clearly, yeah. clearly indicate uh, what you need to look for when you're getting assessment, because there are plenty of people who will provide assessments for you, but you can, you can find yourself uh, paying out twice without realizing yeah. that the right it's assessment. It's really unfortunate. And you would hope that an assessor would if they knew you were going on to university or if they could tell it might be something you would do within the next however many years that they would inform you that you need that qualification and if they haven't got it they you would hope they would send you to someone that has otherwise you can't open the door to that funding so how long is that assessment going to be um because i know they're time-based aren't they they used so to be they changed it Students changed it a few years ago, and the report can now be of any age. It used to have it had to be within two years. Now it can be within any age as long as the assessor is registered in those ways. Well, so, that's a much better way of, of better, going yeah. through. Um, because certainly within schools where I taught, uh, we would take uh, get a dyslexia assessment for a student, perhaps in. Uh, year seven just to clarify that 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 young person needed support and then you would need to get them reassessed before they yeah. took the GCSE so that's now not the case that's not the case now and that was after years of campaigning really and um, pressure from professionals saying yeah. this is unreasonable that people have to get reassessed every few years basically yeah. you don't stop being dyslexic all of a sudden do yeah you? no absolutely not um so even though your the person's diagnostic report will have recommendations on it, which are really, really helpful, once you've applied for the Disabled Students Allowances, they do then link you up with a needs assessor, and that's their own registered assessors who would, at the moment, they're all being done online, the needs assessments, which is fine. They'll be done on, uh, hopefully, video conferencing, but if not, by telephone. Um, and they'll basically do an interview and find out how the person works, what what strategies they already use, what tools they already use, and then they're they're qualified to make um, suggestions about what what might work for you, and then to recommend that. So I, I could still imagine that feeling like quite a daunting process. Um, I would hope that those websites had some accessibility features to help you to be able to navigate them. Um, yeah. yeah, you mean the application process? Yeah, I do, yeah. They can, they can be troublesome. And if people haven't got screen reading software already on their computer, then there, there is obviously an additional load of reading that's got to be done. Mm. Um, and it's worth saying at that point that there's 
um, a computer add-on called Browse Aloud. I don't know if you've ever used that, have you? I've not used it. Oh, it's a little add-on. It's very good. It mysteriously pops up on my phone sometimes when I'm on the internet and it basically will read the screen to you. So it's called Browse Aloud. Browse Aloud. And it's a little, it's called an add-on. Mm. And it just means it adds on to your web browser and then you can highlight the text and then it will pop up with, a. I think it says speak or voice, one of those two. And you press that and it reads what you've highlighted. So that's really handy. And it could be handy if you're filling out online forms. Mm. So yeah. Anything like that brings me out in a sweat when I think I've got to get it exactly <laughs> right and one shot at it or else. Yeah, yeah it's very stressful. It is stressful. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so that's the, a needs assessment. So an assessor will contact the student and interview them and then come up with a package of support ideas. What sort of support ideas might they be? They will be. One of the main things many, many students at university level would really like is one-to-one -one specialist tutoring. So that's rec often a recommendation. Um, I would imagine at the moment that's all online, that tutoring, but generally it would be in person. Um, then, so that would be weekly support. Mm. Then people often want specialist software. So that could be dictation software, drag and dictate, or screen readers, such as text help reader like Gold or Claro Read. Um, it can be hardware, such as an additional screen, because lots of people work better if they have a separate big screen, mm. or working memory, and so you can have multiple documents open at the same time. I, I don't function without two screens because I can't hold the information long enough to be able to work with it. So if two a laptop screen and then a big screen or two big yeah. screens and a laptop. I have uh, my laptop and one big screen and uh, it's crucial if I've got to follow a piece of information from A to B or match up numbers, order things. Yeah. So it really that would mean you could have three documents open, couldn't you? One on your laptop and two on the screen? Potentially, yes. Yeah. It could. That's fantastic for research, isn't it? Because you can look at what you're researching on two places. Maybe you could have the assignment brief open, mm -hmm. check you're on track and then your laptop you're taking notes on. And that's the thing, it's keeping on track, isn't it? If, you, if you're someone who drops that information quite quickly, I, don't, I can be off having all sorts of thoughts before I've even realised I'm off task. Um, yeah. I've gone down a rabbit hole somewhere else. So uh, anything that can keep you uh, within that sort of roadway that you want to be travelling down is crucial. Yeah. An extra screen is a huge, um, it can make a huge difference for a lot of people. And then, so other hardware might be uh, voice recorders for recording your own thoughts and your own uh, essay plans or your own ideas, or it might be to record important conversations with your tutor mm. or in a discussion group. So obviously you need to check with people, they don't mind you recording them because of data protection, but most people um, are okay with that, as long as you ask. Other hardware might be a printer because you do lots of extra printing if you're dyslexic. You maybe like to have um, uh, information in uh, without a glare of a screen and you might find you read better by printing things out so you can get funding for that. You can have funding for photocopying allowance for the same reason. It might be that you want to write on your books. So you can't, obviously can't do that with your library loans. So photocopying allowance. Um, and then it could be, there's other bits of hardware people use, and I'll pass you over to talk about scanning pens, because that's something people would use at un any level, further education or university. Yeah, scanning pen is a useful text reading tool that works without Wi-Fi quite independently. So you can run the pen along text and then either through the inbuilt speaker or through the headphone, it will play back that text to you. Um, particularly useful I think for students who are working with new vocabulary because there's a dictionary um, built into the scanning pen so rather than having to go into a lookup on another device you can just immediately hear mm. the meaning of that word and that that decoding 
um, I think it's quite helpful. Um, I know it's helpful because what happens is instead of feeling at sea, uh, especially if you're, you're trying to do something quite quickly, very often you know what the word means. You're a bright person. You just need that decoded for yeah. you. And then you, you you know you're on the at the same speed as everybody else. So a scanning pen's quite useful, discreet portable tool for that sort of support too. Yeah, so that would be good for notes or for handouts or for books in the library. You could put headphones in, yeah, listen to it. So um, all these different tools that I've just mentioned and that we've just talked about are some people would want some of those. Some people would want all of them. You know, it, it's quite very personal what people find works for them. Would glasses, so say uh, a coloured lens, not thalmic glasses, be part of that hardware? I suppose it would be. The um, if somebody finds they have a lot of visual stress, mm. that, that they have um, symptoms of that, which would mean the text moves or blurred mm. or a lot of tiredness when looking at screens or when reading then you can request that you have an assessment by a behavioural optometrist and they will do a visual skills assessment and will suggest either prisms in the glasses or tinted lenses, which would then mean you could use tinted paper, mm. screen tinting. So that can also become part of the um, disabled students' allowances. And that's very specialist referral that would be an additional referral the needs assessor wouldn't do that bit mm. they would recommend it so um and obviously that takes people time to learn to use some of that software and it always is recommended that people have it with training as well so that they're not suddenly faced with a marvelous piece of dictation software that they're not sure how to use mm. otherwise students tend to never use it because they haven't got the time to learn it that's right. This is this is the, the problem that exists in all sectors, isn't it? You have to have the time to train on the device in addition to the device. Yeah. And uh, sometimes that that gets lost. Um, but it's it's really crucial that if you need additional time for training, that you you share that information and yeah. make sure that happens. Absolutely. And then so that's for university students. And of course, there is also a. Um, learning centres and libraries and study skills centres at the institutions. So support can be obtained through those as well. Um, and then if someone is doing an FE course, or uh, you mentioned workplace training, then there, there would be slightly different processes in place there. But at an FE college, you would still get in touch with the learning support team who may be called the study skills team or the disability services. They all tend to have slightly different names. And you can still access one-to-one -one support through those services, or some colleges will put an extra tutor into a class if they think there's more than one person that needs support. Mm. Those small groups can run. Some colleges do have laptop loans with specialist software on. So it's variable. So I always recommend people phone colleges and find out what support is available. Mm. Um, and, and have a conversation about who that person yeah. is and what their experience of supporting learners with dyslexia are too. Um, yeah. <laughs> there are well-meaning people who are interested and feel that they can support, but actually they don't have the skills that are going to enable you to get the best from your learning opportunities so if you can if you can find somebody who's engaging in additional learning or has a qualification and uh, is really dedicating a fair amount of their time to dyslexia support that that's a good plan um Absolutely, yeah yeah and, and because also there's legal obligations aren't there so many of the exam all the examples for um, exam allowances for students with who are registered with disability um, or not registered if people have specific learning difficulties or hidden needs or health needs there's a whole wealth of exam allowances that can be put in place ranging from extra time to separate room to uh, being able to use your usual way of working which might mean that if you're using a laptop and word processing as your key way of supporting your disability then you would use that in an exam 
Um, if you use specialist software to help you access print, then that would be allowed in an exam. So it's important to know that and to seek it out in good time so it can be applied for with the exam board. That's right. I think the key to what you're saying there is normal way of working. Yeah. Uh, you need to have established this or, you know, at least be in a pattern of work that you can evidence because it all yeah. comes down to evidence in the end. Yeah, and you have to let the college know or the university know sooner rather than later so they can put the procedures in place for reading and apply to the exam board, check the evidence is there to allow them to use these ways of working and to set that up rather than doing it last minute on the day of the exam so and that those would exam allowances are there at university college um workplace learning whatever learning exam allowances are, are there i was just uh looking at the jcq updates to okay. there uh yeah we've just got a september update and there's a nice little passage in there that says that assistive technology should be encouraged and used wherever it will support that learner appropriately because this is the way forward for further education for the workplace and so that's really positive um that everybody now is getting behind assistive tech to support learning and people's normal way of of learning and it's important for students to request it because not all tutors are as up to date as you are on reading their the september updates so it's important to be empowered isn't it and to know your know your rights and to yes request rather than wait to be asked that's right and um when you have got a, a difficulty that that sets you back very often we come from a mindset of feeling a bit anxious and actually you know it's okay you have every right to push forward and get what you need to do the best that you can yeah. and don't step back step forward and get what you need because actually colleges are geared up to give you what you need in the way of support and help um and very often the thing holding us back is ourselves yeah that's a good point yeah okay do you think we do you think we've covered that i i feel like we've we've unpicked that really well you can always come back to it if anybody asks a question or yeah. if you think of something a bit further down the line okay right well i'm going to go to question number two then please kim mm -hmm. I wonder if you could advise how I could support learners with dyslexia via online learning and what difficulties will they be having? I imagine this would come from a teacher, this sort of question, someone uh, who's phoned you because they've got online learners and they're thinking, my goodness, how can I support them at home? What what's going on in their bedroom when they're, you know, they've gone missing for a couple of days and they're not engaging with me? Um, I know certainly that must be the case uh, for many teachers now who are really into this swing of a, a blended and an online learning and at university and further ed I guess that is probably the model of teaching and learning right now. It is and I've looked at a, quite a lot of uh, university websites and FE college websites to see what what they're saying about this mm. and they're suggesting it will be 50% online whereas before it would have been 100% in the classroom. So this is a huge shift for everybody. Mm. So um, lots of tutors, teachers, lecturers have been writing into helplines saying, how do I support those students with the hidden needs and with the additional needs? What do we need to do differently? So we've had to do lots of asking, um, thinking about what do people actually need when they're engaged in online learning in an, an online classroom. Um, so we've published a document on this on the British Dyslexia Association website. So I, shall I discuss through it? Mm, please do, because I'm just thinking there are so many protocols yeah. that are new to all of us. It's new to everybody, and it's the, obviously I think the most important thing any tutor teacher can do is to ask the student what they need, and um, even though the student may not know. They may know and they may say exactly what they need to support them. And some, lots of students with hidden needs have issues with their reading, as we've talked about. So they may be finding that there's much more online reading going on because there's less discussions happening. 
So there may be more notes being delivered to them and updates and emails. So um, we've said to teachers to just check that, like, do, does this student have reading difficulties? What is their normal way of working? So it would be a really good first point of call is to give people the materials as early as you can, mm -hmm. way in advance of a lecture or an online classroom. So the student can either read it two or three times, which they may do, or they may need to convert it into an MP3 file. They might have a way of working. They might like to print it out and then use their scanning pen on it. You know, they might have all sorts of different ways of working. So we need to give them lots of time to do that. So materials in advance. Um, we would also say check the student is confident using the online classroom that's on offer, because it may be that they've got one or two different classrooms and they're just not confident with learning how to use them. So they might need a one to one lesson. There's an assumption. There's, there's an assumption that young people are yeah. all tech savvy, aren't you? You're all tech savvy. <laughs> So check whether they can use the classroom and offer a lesson or two on that. Um, it's really good if you can use an online classroom that can be recorded. And I know many of them do have record buttons so the student can then record the lesson and review it later. But I have met students that say they didn't know they could record it. They didn't know it had a record button. They hadn't thought to put their phone on the app, record app on their phone and switch that on and record it. So there's lots of ways people can record it so encourage students to do that so they can then process all that information at their own time later um I think if you can if if as a, a tutor you can produce some very visual kind of um charts information handouts yep. top, top five tips for success in my online lesson and use icons and minimal text then that's something that i could print out put next to my computer and then I, I know I've got to check those five things because my my memory is not so good but if I've that's got something that's visual there you that would be a great help for me that's a really good idea then um we would say that it's very good if tutors lecturers teachers produce their materials using more, more dyslexia friendly accessibility features mm. so that can be specific fonts specific layouts, uh, not, too, not too much reading in one go. It's good to break reading up with uh, relevant pictures or charts or diagrams. So um, there's a style guide that the British Dyslexia Association have got on their website, which is, gives, all the, gives a good reference point for people how to produce materials that are more readable. Mm. Maybe that the students want specific color paper and it's good to ask if they have a colour they prefer or it's good to produce. It's recommended that people read better from a beige text, beige paper, sorry, with a black text, which removes the glare, removes the screen glare and the white glare. Mm. So, but it's obviously good to ask people and then where possible find information for people that's not doesn't involve reading, which could be video documentaries, podcasts. Um, YouTube videos, there's so many ways of accessing information that doesn't involve sitting there reading all the time. So great if teachers can point students towards those. Um, we ask educators to give information out in bite-sized chunks if they can, with lots of reviews of the ideas that have been presented, lots of opportunities for discussion where possible setting students into groups so they can work more closely in groups with each other and do um, shared and paired learning. Mm, all that good stuff that we, yeah. we uh, that we know works. We can't, we mustn't lose this as part of this new uh, more remote learning no. um, method that we've got. Uh, pair and share works so well. Having buddies works really well, knowing that you've got someone who understands online that you can ask the question to confidently is great. You yeah. know, we need the phone a friend. We really do. Okay. And then obviously helping students to plan their assignments is often very good. Mm -hmm. If someone struggles with deadlines and prioritizing, then to help someone map out their assignment plan. Mm -hmm. 
And they're, there's they're such fun. good there's such good mind mapping uh, apps that mm. are available that you can color code and you can organize exactly the way that you want them shifting whole sections around a screen should you need to completely reorganize our ideas and we know that dyslexic learners very often big picture people and they want all of the information first so the other thing i would say is Give them the outside of the jigsaw puzzle so that they can, you know, they know where the parameters are. Otherwise, they'll be forever working outwards until they think they found the edge. And that might mean going off in all sorts of directions until they actually <laughs> work out where where the boundary of things are. So if yeah. you can, it's just a creative thinking thing, isn't it? You know, how far can I take this idea? And I think it's quite common with dyslexic people that they, you know, they'll just keep going. Um, so provide that overview right at the beginning make sure that information is available and make sure the mind mapping tools are available to use and encourage the use of it so that instead of great blocks of text coming in as part of your preparation for an assignment you're happy to accept one two words that encapsulate that section of knowledge that goes with that you know with the preparation yeah. it's, you know diligently people will spend hours and hours on prep uh re repasting or re going through information when actually they just need to signpost that they understand this is where this information goes then it's followed by that, yeah. then that. and then you can help with the sequencing of things rather than getting right into the detail at, at that planning and organizing phase yeah. and some people love mind maps and some people like bullet points don't they mm -hmm. and it's just about having a structure and working out what's going to go where in the assignment like you've said so i think lots of tutor support for students particularly in with the early assignments to see where the students are at and what kind of support they do need um and then i also think it, with particularly with dyslexic dyspraxic students um to offer to mark a draft version of an assignment can be really really helpful and give the person feedback on changes that are needed um, and it can be very good to give students a model of a good a good piece of work because often people don't know which direction they're heading in and what something should look like or sound like. But to have some examples of a good introduction or a good conclusion or a good answer to an essay um, can be really really helpful for someone with underlying difficulties. And I think over focusing on spellings and grammar and punctuation. We need the content to be there more importantly than anything else. Really good advice. Mm. So let's just pull out, say, five bullet points from that list. So mark for content, mm -hmm. provide structural support, uh, make sure that you have provided the framework and you know where the outside of the jigsaw puzzle is within that information. Yeah. ask the student what is going to support them to ensure that they get that support that they need don't assume that they're getting on okay uh, check in with them and come on give me one more kim i would say check with the student that they've got their support tools in place and have they got the systems and strategies that they used to use that work and is there something they haven't got mm. because i think some learners i mean many learners that say oh, I used to use Drag and Dictate and it was really good and I haven't got it now. And it's just such a shame that, that, that a really important tool they've had, they might have had it at school and they haven't got it here. So, um, there, you know, there's kind of emergency systems we can put in place with people because Microsoft has built in dictation and screen reading. And so do most smartphones, don't they? So sometimes people need a bit of help figuring that out so we could find them a mentor or another student that could maybe show them how to switch the voice on on their phone or how to get the dictation going on Samsung or an iPhone you know they're all slightly different so very practical help yeah. will make a huge difference would that be the fifth one that would be it felt like a fifth a big group rather than one no yeah, that was a good set okay yeah. I think there's some great advice there let's move on to the next question uh, I'm dyslexic and I'm worried about all the online reading we're having to do due to the COVID safe teaching bubbles and learning being done online. 
reading is often the area that lots of very successful learners with underlying difficulties will still say it takes me three four five times longer to read than someone else I read and I don't absorb it I read and I skip words or sentences without knowing so it's a really common um, issue that you must come up against as well all the time with scanning pens which are designed aren't they to support this very thing reading so I suppose if, if someone isn't using specialist tools, I always say to people to, are there ways that read you, that you, what do you do that makes reading easier? Do you read, read in certain lights, mm. do you read at a certain time of the day? Are there certain strategies along those lines that you find you absorb things better and read is more comfortable? So it's good for people to think about that and to experiment. Mm. They can also try different coloured papers or overlays. You can get tinted overlays that can help. Um, it's good for people to read in short chunks. So say read a paragraph and then review it. Try and say back what you've read and try and um, encourage yourself to comprehend yes. and absorb what you've read. That's right. I used to really simplify this down for my students and mm -hmm. say, imagine that your brain's just got two muscles in it, an in muscle and an out muscle. Okay. Just We'll just keep it dead simple. And then the in muscle, you just get through the bit of reading the bit of decoding that you've got to do and then immediately use the out muscle doesn't matter how you use it you could sing it you could make notes on sticky cards you could you know anything or you could even push a bit of plasticine around making something I don't mind how you use the out muscle but you chunk it in out in out because otherwise when you get to the point where you need to bring this information back out, if you've only just exercised the reading bit, this is the mistake people make with revision, I think. They're yeah. cram, cram, cram. And actually they're, they're exercising the wrong muscle because exams are all about out muscle. That's good, That's a good way of putting it. Yeah, simple but a uh, memorable way of, of mm -hmm. thinking, yes, I've got to keep working with this information and keep it live and keep it moving. Mm -hmm. Very, yeah. And also people can do things like highlight the key points in a text, which is why it's good to have photocopies, of, obviously. Although you can highlight on a screen, can't you, as well? Um, I've met people that will take a piece of print, photocopy something and cut it up, mm. have the different sections that they need to remember that way. They might stick them up around the room to try and encourage themselves to learn lots of facts, say they need to learn anatomy or names of plants or with all sorts of ways of having flashcards to help remember That's what you've right. situational based memory is a, a powerful yeah. very powerful way of going about remembering so if you've not come across that it's well worth having a look at uh, how you can activate that part of your memory yeah and of course screen reading software makes a huge difference and i don't know if people know about that particularly and it's where basically everything that's on the screen is read out loud. So if you do skip lines or skip words or struggle to decode a word or recognize a word, that struggle's gone because the computer will read the whole thing out loud. So it speeds up the whole reading process and generally improves people's comprehension because they're not being distracted by a word they don't recognize or a word they don't understand. Or And likewise, when you're submitting your work, if you can go through the same process of listening yeah. to what you've written, you'll soon work out if you've missed bits or misplaced words or perhaps put the, an incorrect word into a sentence yeah. somewhere. Very yeah. powerful. Often if you listen to your own essay, some people like to read it while they're listening. Other people like to shut their eyes and just listen. You'll hear it's confused maybe in that something you put near the end belonged at the beginning or you didn't you didn't wrap up an idea into a conclusion or you've got to put some facts in so um screen reading software helps in so many ways and i think it's a key thing with anyone with underlying processing issues mm. that can make such a huge difference as well as um dictation i don't know if you want to talk about dictation i think you said you use dictation don't you I do when I'm writing I use it a lot um, because my ideas run faster than my hands and <laughs> the other thing that I do is I pretty much record most conversations that I'm involved with in meetings when I know that I've got to backtrack and then 
be accountable for whatever points have, have come across and I don't want to miss anything and I know my memory is poor so I will then listen back on my uh, my dictaphone that I, I carry around to meetings. Likewise um, I know that if I've got a great idea I can just put that dictaphone in and use it if I'm in the car or wherever I might be just to record and then I will use the software that's on the computer if I'm, I'm cantering through an idea it's just essential um mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to be working without it because no, it, everything would take me too long yeah and you're using two really good tools there aren't you that you've narrowed it down to exactly what you need so do you use dic uh, do you use a dictaphone or do you just use your smartphone with a I use both um yeah if i'm if i'm going to uh i like to have a backup <laughs> yeah. yeah so um i've got a nice chunky dictaphone that i have zipped up and that i carry around in my bag and then sometimes um we're not going to shows and things anymore or seeing uh, lectures at the moment but i really enjoy that and sometimes i just use the speech to text on my phone and i'll record it at the same time okay yeah yeah full belt and braces for me particularly if i think something's really crucial information that i need to be absorbing uh, and then i'll work with both both bits of information depending on whether my eyes are tired or uh, you know how i'm feeling so that gives you good backup doesn't it but it also enables you to process all that information at a later date mm. and also have the confidence to know you don't need to sit there taking notes mm. although i like i still take notes as well <laughs> Full belt and braces. <laughs> well, I think that's good because you're using all your senses, aren't you? You're using your motor sense to write, then you're using your auditory, you're using your visual skills to look up the information. So you're kind of doing a proper multi-sensory way of learning, which is the best way to get information to stick. Oh, I know it won't stick if I don't do those things. So, yeah, it's, it's taken a long time to work it all out, but you get there eventually. <laughs> Yeah, I think you're a good advocate for those tools because mm. I think successful learners who have underlying processing difficulties may have some particular tools that they really depend on mm. and that they can't be without. And I think it's really important that we encourage that, that for people to use what they need. I often meet people that say, oh, I shouldn't use dictation because I'm getting lazy and I'll never learn to spell. And it's just not, it's not how it is. It's about capturing your ideas, isn't it? And writing quickly and working to reflect your skills rather than um, feeling like you're underperforming mm. so I think assistive technology is there to be used and I think everyone will be using it within the next 10 years without a doubt just the dyslexic and the dyspraxic people I think the whole world is going in that direction really yeah yeah I'm absolutely certain of it yeah. we're just we're just leading the way here yeah <laughs> So um, do you think we've covered this question for this person asking about supporting their reading online? I think so. I think we've, yeah. we've given a lot of tips there. I really like what we said about colour and light. Um, I know mm. that I, I can't have any glare when I'm working because it exhausts me. And that took me a long time to work out as well. Why am I feeling so tired? Oh, it's just because of the glare. Uh, sometimes it's silly things and you, you don't work it out often people don't experiment with moving their computer or lowering the glare or printing it out and reading off paper some people read better in natural light some people don't need a tint they just need to adopt lighting strategies um, and I think most people are sitting for too long at computers and are getting eye strain as well which is going to help reading speed and comprehension as well because you'd be being distracted by discom external discomfort. Mm. So um, mm. it's really important to adjust these things and not to just plow on mm. something that's just causing such an immense amount of difficulty. Well, we're in this strange situation where we are a lot more sedentary now and um, <laughs> we've got to look after ourselves. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Okay, I think we are on to our last question. Yeah. So, oh yeah, this is perfect. I get disorganised and I miss deadlines. Can you give me some tips? Well, this is making you smile. <laughs> <laughs> I want to find the last minute. 
Pardon? I am one of life's last minuters. I I try really hard to be organised. I have this fantastic facade of being the most organised person in the world. And uh, I'm not sure that I am really, because uh, everything catches me out, even though I've planned the nth degree, and that is just working memory. I've organised it, I've planned it, I know what I'm doing, and then I forget what I'm doing. But you are organised. The experience I've had with you is you are organised and you do, you're very efficient. So you probably feel like you've put so much effort into that mm. that it means it's not real, but it is real. You're just, you're being very, very organised and efficient. And you've obviously got lots of strategies to keep you on track. And let's face it, most of us are multitasking, multiple language-based activities, aren't we? Whether it's mm. note-taking, whether it's reading, whether it's writing, we've got a list of things in the back of our head that need doing as well as all our personal lives that we're trying to organize, phoning the dentist or the optician. So it's just really important, isn't it, to capture that and not to hold it all in working memory. Mm. Have somewhere that you put that down. And most people have more than one system in place. They don't just use a diary. They may use a diary. They may use a wall planner. They may use a calendar on their phone with alerts for certain things and not others. They may have a to-do list or a, 10 to-do lists they're all completely normal and it doesn't matter if they're an explosion as long as it's a system that works for you <laughs> it's a system isn't it i'm glad you said it's okay to have multiple organization systems because i okay. surely do absolutely i don't think anybody has one i think we all have three or four plus mm. and there's also some fantastic online system planners project planners like trello and other ones like that, where you have an online tool where you log your tasks and then you can build little to-do lists into each. The one I, on, I've used on Trello, it's like little tiles and you can put pictures and JPEGs and MP3s into each tile and you can share them with other people. And each one can be a project. So it could be an assignment or part of an assignment. Mm. So um, it seems a lot to learn, but they're, often worth it mm. as well as using small whiteboards that some people have that just as a to-do list or post-it notes we've all got these haven't we we have different post-it notes so i think um, and to get some help from your tutors on when are the deadlines and which how to break a subject up into say eight parts and to plot each one as a deadline. So oh, that's such good advice because it can just be so overwhelming. You know, you've got to hit the deadline on a certain date, but how on earth do you break it all up? So, yeah, getting that segmentation of tasks is crucial. Yes, yeah, so it may be that you research the initial plan and then go to the library. It's another task, get the books, read certain books. So, you may put deadlines on all those different sections and then deadlines on the actual assignment writing mm. so you'll have maybe 25 percent of it done by a week before the deadline and then you'll aim to have 50 percent of it done four days before people work different ways don't they mm. but i think it's good to map it out so you're not doing everything at the last minute so the whole thing isn't being done the night before <laughs> we've all been there <laughs> good that's really really good advice yeah and use that tutor and ask them you know if you have got organizational difficulties just be upfront about it and and let them know they're not going to be surprised all teachers come across people with organizational difficulties and they understand and um, very often they've got great strategies that they can share with you and good advice and getting that frequent feedback so that you know you're on yeah. you're on track and you haven't missed a whole section out for example um that's really important to keep talking to your tutor i remember being in fear of a tutor and um getting almost to the end of a project and thinking oh gosh i i haven't had enough feedback i i'm lost in this yeah. and it was just because i was in fear and i didn't go and get support um so my advice is yeah, keep, keep talking keep sharing that's their job paying right? paying to support you through your studies and it's right like for you for that, isn't it and it's that, great if you can 
make an agreement with a tutor that you'll give them a draft, say, four weeks before the deadline, and then they will review it for you, give you some comments, and then you can what maybe give them a second draft mm. two weeks before the deadline, and then you're, you're really on track. If, you, if the teacher gives you deadlines, then you're more likely to keep up to them, aren't you? That's so, it. Yeah. Work yeah. with people, share the information, don't feel anxious, don't feel ashamed. Um, yeah. Just share what you need to be the best that you can be. It would be my advice to you. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's the most important thing. You know, you absolutely have a right to be having the education that you're that you're absorbing, that you're uh, engaged with it's not happened by fluke you're doing it because you should be doing it so get the support you need to do it right and you are bright and sparky and brilliant and please get that help that you need rather than hiding yeah dyslexic students often get the highest grades because they often put extra work in they go the extra mile and that's often reflected in um, grading systems which is wonderful isn't it but then they do often want that a bit of extra support in place so it's important to balance it out isn't it and get the help not struggling not suffer in silence absolutely okay so i think we've we've gone through our four questions i think we've got some superb answers thank you kim and um we've just got a bit of an opportunity now if people want to open up and have conversation then we'll stay put and we'll uh, we'll talk through anything that comes along in the the chat box so we'll be here for a little bit longer but we're essentially at the end of the webinar now so thank you very much indeed for being with us today and for uh, Kim thank you so much for your time again and uh, really valuable and if people have got extra questions outside of this webinar they can write to the BDA helpline Right, which yeah, reminds me, yeah. let me put that slide on for uh, the BDA because, yeah. how do I get slide number two up? Yay, there we go. Um, so if you would like to phone or talk to Kim or the team at the BDA for support, the number is there for you, 0333 405 4567 and you also have an email service that I know is being used well have you got people back in the office now Kim they're partially back so the helpline lines are beginning to open up but in quite a restricted way so people need to look at the website to see when they're open and but the help but the emails are being answered every day so helpline at bdadyslexia.org.uk um, for any questions people have, might think of later, which is fine. And when this goes onto YouTube, which I know will, I'll make sure that we've got all the information listed that we've talked through today Great. and we'll put that into the comments. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for joining the Succeed with Dyslexia webinar.